as many of you might know, suffrage has a long history in the United States. And what I'm really going to focus on today are these last few years when we saw the movement really take a turn in terms of its tactics, its leadership, its messaging, um, and that ultimately results in, in, in a victory for a suffrage campaign that was over 150 years old. So what happened actually 100 years ago today in Tennessee? Well, it all really came down to the vote of one man, and he's pictured here, Henry T. Byrne. Um, Tennessee had brought the 19th Amendment to the state legislature, and in, in the legislature, uh, there was a vote uh, being taken to actually table the amendment. Uh, the vote came down to a tie, 48-48, and Henry Byrne had been one of those who had voted to indeed table uh, any discussion of the 19th Amendment for this particular term of the state legislature. The speaker decided to hold another vote, and this time to actually vote up or down on ratifying the 19th Amendment. And lo and behold, to everyone's surprise, Henry Byrne voted to, in fact, ratify the 19th Amendment. Now, one of the questions we've always asked is, what made him seemingly change his mind? What people did not know was that Henry Byrne actually had in his pocket a letter from his mother. And his mother had written to him these words. Dear son, hurry and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech it was very bitter. I've been waiting to see how you stood, but have not seen anything yet. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put the rat in ratification? Ha. So Henry was indeed a good boy, voted as his mother bid, and the rest, as we could say, is history, or in this case, maybe it's better to say herstory. Now, who was the cat that um, Henry's mother was referring to in her letter? She was Carrie Chapman Cat, who was the president of the National American Women Suffrage Association. Carrie Chapman Cat was a very influential in the suffrage movement. And here we see her really taking her victory lap. She had been in Nashville lobbying when the vote took place. And right after uh, Tennessee voted to ratify the 19th Amendment, took a train to Washington, DC, where she met with Woodrow Wilson to ensure that the 19th Amendment was in fact ratified by the Secretary of State. And that occurred on August 26, 1920. Here's a picture where she next goes to New York and is greeted by fellow suffragists who are celebrating this historic moment of Tennessee becoming the 36th state. A different kind of celebration was taking place, however, by one of Kat's rivals, the other major leader in the suffrage movement at this time, Alice Paul. Alice Paul, who was the head of the National Women's Party, she unfurled a flag upon hearing that Tennessee had ratified the 30th the 19th Amendment um, from the office headquarters of the National Women's Party. And here you can see that what the National Women's Party had done was really deployed a kind of ingenious political, um, uh, a political trick to a certain extent by sewing a flag, a star to a flag every time one state ratified the 19th Amendment. Um, they kind of called themselves the Betsy Rosses of suffrage. And here with Tennessee, they unfurl the flag from their headquarters, stage this photograph um, really to celebrate this historic moment. Um, they also publish a victory issue of their magazine, The Suffragist, and in this uh, replicate their flag. Um, and everything that uh, the National Women's Party did was very intentional, it was very symbolic. The women you can see here are dressed in white, uh, suffragists always dressed in white, that was to symbol the purity of their cause and their, and in a sense to emphasize their femininity. And even the colors in the flag that, that are replicated here on this magazine cover um, are, are meant to signify something. Purple as the color of loyalty, as white as I've mentioned, the color of the emblem of purity, and then gold, the color of life and liberty. And so we can start to see that in, in all of this, the suffragists have a cause, they have claims to make, but they're, they're also uh, demonstrating to us their political savvy. The, they recognize the importance of propaganda of, and of visual imagery and how they are portraying their cause. Now, uh, one thing as we begin to start talking about exactly how they fashioned this movement and, and arrived at this moment of victory that I want to emphasize um, may seem like a little bit of a detour, but it, but it is important. It's literally the question of what we call these women. 
So I don't know about you, but I know for me and many of my friends, when we were children, one of the first ways that we were actually introduced to the suffrage movement was through the children's movie, Mary Poppins. And if you're familiar with the film, you know that Mrs. Banks, the, the mother in the family, is herself um, an ardent suffragette. And this is where you can really feel the hackles of historians of the movement um, beginning to rise because most historians dismiss the term suffragettes um, as a way to describe the suffrage movement. In part, this is because the term itself was coined by a London newspaper in 1906 to diminish the cause by adding the sort of et to the end of the word it was, it was intended to imply that this movement was frivolous, that these women were, were sort of airheads and that they did not need to be taken seriously. And if you think about the movie, in some ways it actually perpetuates that stereotype of the suffrage movement because as Mrs. Banks herself is really a scatterbrain, she's not a particularly good mother, she can't control her staff, and she also doesn't even really seem that dedicated to the cause because at the end of the movie she in fact takes that sash off, it turns into the tail of the children's kite, and they sort of, they sort of uh, fly it as she comes back and assumes the natural role that she should have in the family as mother and, and wife um, dedicated to domestic bliss. And so uh, just, uh, just, to, just to think a little bit about the terminology that we use and what we, what we actually convey, depending on the type of term that we, that we talk. So I will be saying suffragists. Uh, I encourage you to do the same because that is really the word that uh, reflects the seriousness, the sense of purpose, and, and really, honestly, the sense of political genius that these women demonstrated in bringing about this major victory uh, to voting rights in the United States. Okay, so now we have our terms straight. So let's think a little bit about how we actually get to this moment in 1920. And here, I want to emphasize, in a sense, sort of three sets of debates that really dominate the suffrage movement in the early 20th century, which is when we see real momentum gathering and, and, uh, and a kind of accelerated pace of change when it comes to women's voting rights. I want to think a little bit about the debate both for suffrage, but also the debate against suffrage, because clearly there were many people in America who did not think that suffrage for women was a good idea. That sometimes surprises my students these days. We kind of have a natural assumption, of course, women uh, can vote. Um, but a lot of people, you know, 100 years ago, didn't feel that way. Um, and then, as I kind of implied by setting up uh, uh, Carrie Chapman Catt and Alice Paul as rivals, there's a debate within the movement. Uh, these two women, uh, over time, came to disagree about both what the, the purpose uh, the strategy of the movement should be, and also the tactics that they should employ. And then finally, while today is a day to celebrate a major achievement in the advancement of voting rights in the United States, we should also recognize that there was another debate going on within the movement, which is which women were actually going to get the right to vote from the 19th Amendment. We are incorrect if we say all women got the right to vote because in fact, many women of color were still excluded from having the ability to vote even after the 19th Amendment was ratified to the constitution. And so we want to, we want to uh, spend some time talking about that as well. Okay, so let's think a little bit about this debate between the people who are for suffrage and the people who are against suffrage. So just like the pro-suffrage arm, uh, people who were against suffrage employed all sorts of visual um, images and propaganda to make their case. This here is one of my favorites because it really kind of suggests that if women get to, to vote, the whole world is gonna turn upside down. Men are gonna be feminized, women are gonna be mas uh, emas emasculized, <laughs> excuse me. Um, and you see the man here um, wearing the apron, holding the crying children. The woman's going out to vote. She really looks like, you know, she's wearing the pants in the family. And if you look at the one here on the right, she's literally wearing the pants in the family here as her husband uh, uh, scrubs the, the clothes clean. And so this sense that voting was not an innocuous thing. Thing, that it was really going to challenge the social gender order of American society and be tremendously disruptive, you can see, you can see those fears clearly represented here.